I'm a data science. And in the last class, we have uh, we have done graph neural networks. Yeah. So in the last class, we have we have seen graph neural networks, and today we will uh, go through some hands-on material for for graph neural networks. And if we have time, I will go through this uh, the attention mechanisms in this book, which is dive into deep learning. It's available for free at d2l.ai. And we'll go through the attention mechanisms and the generative adversarial networks from here. Okay, so before that, first let's complete the, let us see some, some of the hands-on material for graph neural networks. And you can, yeah, so it's, so graph there is a there is a library dedicated for graph neural networks or what we call as the geometric deep learning it's called pyg and you can so pyg is built on top of pytorch and this has got lots of uh, tutorials and uh, other material we will we'll see that in brief so TensorFlow uh, also has this uh, like associated module for graph neural networks. And uh, so you can see why, so we have already discussed this in the last class, why use graph neural networks. And because they can model relationships between different types of data. Now, for those of you who might be like have forgotten, uh, why we are talking so much about graph neural networks you should go back and see this paper that we saw in the first class i think or or in the second class in the introductory lecture so you should just go and search uh, this forecasting global weather with graph neural networks and so these like graph neural networks are uh, like for unstructured data, data sets. For example, the kind of data that we have on uh, like the entire global data, which is on a spherical, uh, spherical domain. So this TensorFlow graph neural network library, it provides building blocks for implementing GNN models in TensorFlow and uh, we'll quickly uh, skip through the text here okay so here this is this is an example uh using tf gnn keras api so tensorflow graph neural network keras api to recommend movies to a user based on what they watched and genres that they like so they they use the con gnn builder method to specify the type of edge and node configuration namely uh, to use weighted sum convolution so you can see that uh, this tensorflow underscore gnn this is the tensorflow graph neural network module or tensorflow graph neural network library and uh, oh, we have these model uh, hyperparameters so we would have to embed the users in an embedding space so the embedding dimension for the user is 256 the embedding dimension for movie is 64 and embedding dimension for genre is 128 now we'll have to build this uh <clears throat> con gnn builder okay so model this we are we are basically uh instantiating an object of this uh of this class con gnn builder from keras as uh and the object is gnn so uh okay so what is lambda edge set name and lambda node set name so 
what is so we, if you remember we have talked about edges and nodes in the graph neural networks so what are what is the edge set name so this weighted some convolution from the tf gnn library this is this is the edge set name and uh, this is the node set name and so we would do two rounds of message passing to get uh, target node sets so the way you would build your model is uh, we we are so we have seen before in tensorflow you can build models by two types one is the sequential module and another is functional functional is used for if you if you want to uh, customize your uh, your model or use things like skip connections in resnets and so first we will uh, so we'll use this gnn dot convol so gnn is is this uh, object so you first convol over genres so this one this uh, operation sends messages from movie to genre and then you convol over the user so this sends messages from movie and genre to users and then uh, you have this tfgnn.keras.layers readout and uh, so this is where uh, you so what what are we reading out we're reading the user and then at the end we have a, a single uh, neuron which is uh, represented by the dense layer and uh, okay so the code above works great sometimes we may have to use more powerful uh, custom model architecture for our gnns for example in our previous case we might want to specify that certain movies or genres hold more weight when we give our recommendation and in the following sn snippet we define a more advanced gnn with custom graph convolutions in this case with weighted edges so we define the weighted sum convolution class to pool edge values as sum of weights across all the edges so we have this weighted sum convolution class now this has got a single function it is it is the call function and in this graph uh, in this class this is a child class of the uh, tensorflow keras layer class and in the arguments what we have uh, is a graph tensor as the first argument and the second argument is the edge set name so which has the data type as tfgnn dot edge set name and the output is tfgnn dot field so for like going through in detail to this uh, in this library so you'll have to go through this tensorflow underscore gnn uh, library in detail we'll we are just uh, going through very briefly over this so yeah i mean that's that's about tensorflow graph neural network library so next uh, we have uh, okay i will go through maybe the pyg which is the pytorch geometric library so most of the uh, most of the development or the community is using pytorch for uh, like these days if you go and see uh, if you just go and see tensorflow versus pytorch in cvpr or uh, yeah so you can you can see this uh, at this top machine learning venues eccv nips acl icml cvpr so this is for nips you can see that uh, the solid line is the pytorch and the dotted line is tensorflow and this is updated until 2020 so i was seeing the recent ones until 2022 so tensorflow uh, like the community using uh, using tensorflow has really come down and people are uh, switching more and more to pytorch these days so we will we will go through this uh, first first is the uh, hands on graph neural networks uh, in google collab 
using the PyG library. Okay. I will yeah so the first step is that yeah so the first step is that okay so we we just print our pytorch version and then uh, you install these libraries dot scatter dot sparse and this is the pytorch geometric library and since we are dealing with graph neural networks so uh, like we would need to visualize the graphs. So for that, network X library is something we'll be using, and uh, we are importing the matplotlib.pyplot. And this is the visualize graph function. And uh, the next we have, yeah. So the next we have the visualize embedding. So you can see that uh, we this visualize graph it just takes the argument as a graph and it it will visualize uh, it will use this draw network function from the network x library and it will draw the graph for us and then yeah this is visualize embedding function so let us wait for this uh, installation to get completed and we'll go through let us go through this introduction in the meantime so it says that recently deep learning on graphs has emerged to one of the hottest research fields in the deep learning community. Here graph neural networks aim to generalize classical deep learning concepts to irregular structured data in contrast to images or text and to enable neural networks to reason about objects and their relations. relations. This is done following a simple neural message passing scheme where node features XV, so these are the different nodes uh, and also like they they are embedded in their respective embedding dimensions so this has already run let us finish this reading uh, of all nodes so these nodes are v small v is an element of capital v these are all the nodes in the graph g so the graph uh, consists of v comma e i think this is the these are the edges are iteratively updated by aggregating localized information from their neighbors. So this is what we saw in the last class also. We are not changing the connectivity structure in the graph. It's only the uh, node embeddings or the edge embeddings which are, which are getting updated. And how they are getting updated is by aggregating localized information from their, from their neighbors. So at the layer L plus one, we have a function L plus one which takes in as input the features at L and uh, these are the uh, weights from the uh, from the neighbors. So they the weights from the neighbors get uh, aggregated and uh, you get the next layer information and it says that this tutorial will introduce you to some of the fundamental concepts regarding deep learning on graphs via graph neural networks based on the PyTorch geometric library and PyTorch geometric is an extension library to the popular deep learning framework PyTorch and consists of various methods and utilities to ease the implementation of graph neural networks and following KIF, KIF et al 2017 let's dive into the world of GNNs by looking at simple graph structured data the well-known Zachary's karate club network this graph describes a social network of 34 members of a karate club and documents links. So I think this one, this example is uh, the one we saw in which uh, there are two people who have uh, started grouping the members of a karate club. And uh, we have to basically predict which member goes to the goes to which group. And here we are interested in detecting communities that arise from members interaction and PyTorch geometric provides an easy access to this data set via dots geometric dot data set sub package. Okay, so let us see this. So from dots geometric dot data sets import karate club. 
so we have uh, so this karate club is a class we have made an object of the class so this is the data set karate club and number of graphs so you use the function len uh, so it gives so this is this is just a single graph number of features so data set dot uh, num underscore features this is an attribute of the graph uh, like data type inside dot pi dot geometric and what are the number of classes so after initializing karate club data set we first can inspect some of its properties for example we can use uh, we can see that this data set holds exactly one graph and that each node in this data set is assigned to 34 dimensional feature vector so you can see that uh, the number of features here we have printed as 34 which uniquely describes the members of the karate club furthermore the graph holds exactly four classes which represents the community each node belongs to so this is this looks like a node classification problem wherein there are different people uh, or different members of the karate club and uh, each one of them has uh, it has got some kind of affiliation to uh, and those groups or affiliations are represented by these four classes and now let's look at the underlying graph in more detail so uh, this is the first graph object so we extract the first graph object here as uh, data set zero and you when you when you print this so this gets printed so data this is 34 cross 34 edge index so you have these edge index indices 2 comma 156 and y equal to 34 and train mask is equal to 34 so what is this edge index representing if you remember we had seen uh, from the introductory class so this node number 2 and node number 156 these are connected uh, these form an edge so in the as a first graph object okay so how many number of nodes are there there are 34 nodes and also we have 34 number of features uh, or the embedding size is also 34 now the number of edges is equal to 156 and average node degree is 4.59 so those of you who have uh, who have dabbled with with uh, with graphs and graph theory must be aware of this term known as degree so degree is the average number of connections that each each node has and okay so uh, we have the train mask so this is the train mask and uh, when we sum this it comes to four so there are these four train masks and uh, next we have the training node label rate uh, which is uh, which is represented by this so we have 12% uh, of the nodes which have been labeled and has isolated nodes so this doesn't have any isolated nodes has self loops so doesn't have any self loop and is it undirected so uh, if you remember we talked about directed and undirected edges in a graph so this graph is basically undirected so this function is undirected uh, returns whether the graph is directed or undirected now each graph in pytorch geometric is represented by a single data object and which holds all the information to describe its graph representation we can print the data object anytime via print data to receive a short summary about its attributes and their shapes so you can see that uh, we can print this data object uh, for for the graph in the pytorch using pytorch geometric and we can see that this data object holds four attributes so this is one two three and four so we have these four attributes as edge index x y and train mask so the edge index property holds the information about the graph connectivity that is a tuple of source and destination node indices for each edge so pytorch pyg further uh, refers to node features as x each of the 34 nodes is assigned to a 34 dimension feature feature vector 
so we are embedding our each node as a 34 dimensional feature vector and we also have the node label so what is the node label here y is equal to 34 each node is assigned to exactly one class there are all there also exists an additional attribute called train mask which describes for which nodes we already know their community assignments so in total we are only aware of the ground truth labels of four nodes one for each community and the task is to infer the community assignment of the remaining nodes so basically we we know the information of only uh, some uh, restricted number of nodes and uh, so we want to we want to uh, infer which node or which member in the karate club uh, would be would be associated with which uh, class so that is the task in this uh, in this example and the data object also provides some utility functions to infer some basic properties of the underlying graph for example we can easily infer whether there exists isolated nodes in the graph whether the graph contains self loops or whether the graph is undirected so now let us inspect the edge index property in more detail so we have uh, so this data it's uh, is the first graph object that we have extracted from so this is the karate club data set and uh, we will inspect the edge index property so edge index we are uh, is a feature of the data uh, object so let us okay so these are the these are the edge indices so by printing edge index we can understand how pi g represents graph connectivity internally we can see that for each edge index edge index holds a tuple of two node indices so you can see all these uh, connection of these node indices sorry yeah where the first value describes the node of the source node and the second value describes the node index of the destination node of an edge now this representation is known as the coo format or the coordinate format commonly used for representing sparse matrices so instead of holding the adjacency information in a dense representation pi g represents the graph sparsely which refers to only holding the coordinates just give me a minute yeah so pi g represents graphs sparsely uh, which refers to only holding the coordinates or values for which entries in a are non zero so if you remember this we were talking about the adjacency list so this is something similar to that rather than storing the entire information as an adjacency matrix which will be highly memory inefficient we are storing the uh, storing the edge index as uh, only only the entries for which the adjacency uh, a entries in a are non zero and importantly <coughs> pi g does not distinguish between directed and undirected graphs and treats undirected graphs as a special case of directed graphs in which reverse edges exist for every entry in edge index so in in a in a directed graph uh you will just have this kind of an entry 0 comma 12 uh let's say this is a this is a directed edge so in this the source this will be the source node and this will be the destination node whereas if it is an undirected edge you will have both 0 12 and 12 0 so that's what they mean from this sentence that pi g does not distinguish between directed and undirected graphs you will have double entries uh for the for the uh, reverse edges as well and we can further visualize the graph by converting it to network x library format which implements in addition to graph manipulation functionalities powerful tools for visualization so you can see that uh, so first you have to convert your uh, pi g graph to a network x graph okay so we take this data 
and uh, we say okay to undirected equal to true so we are forcing it to be undirected graph and now visualize uh, graph so this visualize graph i think it's coming from from the network x library yeah we'll we'll see that later and uh, what is the color uh, so these colors represent the different classes so this is a this is a node classification task and and in this case each each node here represents a class and so this is the graph that that we are, we are uh, we are talking about and after learning about pygs data handling it is it is time to implement our first graph neural network so for this we will use one of the simple most simple gnn operators the gcn layer which is the graph convolution layer which is defined as x l plus 1 so x is this is the for each node uh, like and it has got it is embedded into n dim dimensions equal to w l plus 1 and you sum over all the nodes and uh, One by C W V into X W L. So let's see what these uh, terminologies are. Where X W L plus one denotes a trainable weight matrix of the shape, number of output features, comma number of input features, and C W W V refers to a fixed normalization coefficient for each edge. So Pi G implements this layer via G C N con. Which can be executed by passing in the node representation x and the CO graph connectivity representation edge index. So with this, we are ready to create our first graph neural network by defining the network structure in a torch dot nn dot module. So this one uh, you must be remembering. We did some. Uh, I think we we have seen uh, in the PyTorch tu tutorials. So the use of neural network module from PyTorch. so we import this gcn con class from uh, pytorch geometric and uh, linear from torch dot nn and also import torch so we create this gcn class here which is a which is a child class of the parent torch dot nn dot module and so first you will uh, first first you will instantiate the the base class which is torch dot nn dot module and uh, then we are using a seed uh, for reprodu reproducibility so after that you can see we create three layers here con1 con2 and con3 so what is con1 so con1 is gcn uh, con and dataset dot num features so uh, comma 4 so this is basically taking uh, the number of features that we have uh by by 4 and uh, this is equal to 34 in our case and then this second gcn uh con this will take four as input four as uh, outputs so this one if you can if you see here it, it represents uh number of output features comma number of input features and then we have this con3 as the third layer so in the end we have a classifier which is consisting of two nodes and uh, the output number of nodes is 2 and uh, the output is dataset uh, dot num classes so these are the number of classes that get input to this linear and so here we build our graph neural network so first is uh, we we take in this x as an input in this forward function and so we we pass this x through this con uh, object and uh, con comma edge index so as many number of edges it has so that many uh, so the convolution between the x and the edge index and then you apply the nonlinear activation function to it now after after doing that so we we then do the second convolution layer and then the non linear activation function then you go through the third convolution layer and also the non linear activation and then you take this classifier uh, so this will basically output you
Okay, just a minute. I have a network problem. So yeah. My screen must have frozen, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, just give me a moment to share again. Yeah, is it visible now? Yes, sir. Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we will have to reconnect this again. Uh, there was a network drop here. Yeah. Okay, so let us run this. Yeah, so here we initialize all of our building blocks in init and define the computation flow of our network in forward. So we first define and stack three graph convolution layers, which corresponds to aggregating three hop neighborhood information around each node. So all nodes up to three hops away. And in addition, the GCN con layers reduce the node feature dimensionality to two that is so we start from 34 and go to four four and then two which is like uh, uh, was defined here uh, and each gcn con layer is enhanced by a tan edge non-linearity so after that we apply a single linear information torch dot and then dot linear that acts as a classifier to map our nodes to one out of the four classes or communities and we return both the outputs of the final classifier as well as the final node embeddings produced by our graph neural network. We proceed to initialize our final model via GCN and printing our model produces a summary of all its used submodules. So embedding the Karate Club network, let us take a look at the node embeddings produced by our graph neural network. Here we pass in the initial node features X and the graph connectivity information edge index to the model and visualize its two dimensional embedding. So this is what we can see now. So this is the model. And uh, so we are extracting the embedding in the uh, by by passing through the model our uh, our input X and the edge index. So what is the embedding shape here? In this case, it says 34 comma two and then visualize embedding. So you visualize this edge. OK. So remarkably, even before training the weights of our model, the model produces an embedding of nodes 
that closely re resembles the community structure of the graph. So you can see here this embedding of the nodes. It represents the community structure. This is the community structure of the graph. And nodes of the same color are already close, closely clustered together in the embedding space. Although the weights of our model are initialized completely at random and we have not yet performed any training so far. So this leads to the conclusion that GNNs introduce a strong inductive bias leading to similar embeddings for nodes that are close to each other in the input graph. So uh, we have also read about inductive bias. If you remember inductive bias is like uh, for structured data set for image data sets. Uh, the the cells which are close to each other uh, or the time series data set one one uh, number comes after the other and that uh, another comes after the other so there is a structure in the data itself and uh, these embeddings are uh, are basically preserving the uh, this this in in bias which is which is there in the data and now training on the karate club network so but we can do better let's take a look at uh, example on how to train our network parameters based on the knowledge of community assignments of course in the graph so since everything in our model is differentiable and parameterized we can add some labels so train the model and observe how the embeddings react and here we make you of a semi-supervised or transducive trans learning procedure we simply train against one node class but are allowed to make use of the complete input so training our model is very similar to other pytorch models in addition to defining our network architecture we define a loss criteria here which is the cross entropy loss and initialize a stochastic gradient optimizer here in this case adam and after that, we perform multiple rounds of optimization where each round consists of a forward and backward pass to compute the gradients of our model parameters with respect to the loss derived from forward pass. So if you are not new to PyTorch, this scheme should appear familiar to you. I hope that you guys are uh, like whatever projects you are doing and uh, you have got familiarized at least with either PyTorch or TensorFlow. So otherwise, PyTorch provides a good introduction on, okay, anyways. So while we compute node embeddings for all the nodes, we only make use of the training nodes for computing the loss. So here is here, this is implemented by filtering the output of the classifier out and ground truth labels data.y to only contain the nodes in the train mask. So let us now start training and see how node embeddings evolve over time. So let us see this. And we instantiate our model object as model equal to GCN. Now our criterion, our loss function is uh, cross entropy loss. Optimizer is Adam. So as we have seen in PyTorch, first you have to uh, in the optimizer, you have to clear all the gradients. So just like flushing all the gradients to zero, and then you create uh, so you create a prediction from so single this is a single forward pass you have to say out comma a which is the embeddings and out will consist of the the output from here and then you compute the loss uh, so which is based on this criterion cross entropy loss and uh, so this is based on the out data dot train mask and data dot y data dot train mask so this is the model predicted uh, label and this is the this is the ground truth and then you uh, perform back propagation loss dot backward and then update the after performing the back propagation your derivative or your gradients get updated and then using those derivatives you update uh, using uh, using gradient descent you update uh, your parameters or the embeddings of the graph uh, neural network. So this is the train uh, train step and this returns loss comma H. So for epochs in range 401, so we are uh, having the total number of epochs as 401. Loss comma H equal to train data. So we perform training for 401 epochs and at every 
10th epoch we will visualize the embedding so let us see how this is okay so you can see that this is uh, train the graph neural network is training yeah so the 400 epochs training is over and as one can see our three layer graph convolution model manages to linearly separate the communities and classify most of the nodes correctly so furthermore we did this all with a few lines of code thanks to PyTorch geometric library which helped us out with data handling and GNN implementation. So this concludes the first introduction of uh, the world of GNNs and PyTorch geometric. So let us now go to the, okay, shall we do more hands-on or, okay. So after this, uh, we will have a, very quickly we will go to attention mechanisms. Okay. Yeah, so if you see, if you see this book, uh, the introduction, the preliminaries, uh, the neural networks, multi-layer septrons, these things have been covered in detail in deep learning computation. And uh, so, I am also planning a class by Dr. Rajiv Chattopadhyay on self-organizing maps. So next week, I am requesting him to take uh, like one or two sessions on that. But in the meanwhile, uh, so in this one, I, at least until the chapter number nine, we have broadly covered most of the things. So we will we will see attention mechanisms, so which are very important. Uh, we'll give a reading to this today. Now, uh, so the attention mechanism, so the optic nerve of a primate's visual system receives massive sensory input. So your eyes basically receive a lot of input far exceeding what the brain can fully process. And fortunately, not all stimuli are created equally. So focalization and concentration of consciousness have enabled primates to direct attention to objects of interest, such as prey and predators in the complex visual environment. So the ability of paying attention to only a small fraction of the information has evolutionary significance, allowing human beings to live and succeed. And scientists have been studying attention in the cognitive neuroscience field since 19th century. In this chapter, we will begin by reviewing a popular framework explaining how attention is deployed in a visual scene. Inspired by the attention cues in this framework, we will design models that leverage such attention cues and notably the the Nadaraya what was kernel regression in 1964 is a simple demonstration of machine learning with attention mechanisms. So next we will go on to introduce attention functions that have been extensively used in the design of attention models in deep learning and specifically we will show how to use these functions to design the Bardanu uh, attention again making attention model in deep learning that can align by directionality and is differentiable so in the end equipped with recent multi-head attention and self-attention designs we will have the transformer architecture based solely on the attention mechanisms since their proposals in 2017 transformers have been pervasive in modern deep learning applications such as areas of language vision speech and reinforcement learning so reinforcement learning is something that we have not seen until yet uh, i will try to cover uh, reinforcement learning as well now attention cue uh, okay so thank you for attention to this book thank you for attention to this lecture as well is a it's a scarce resource at the moment you are reading this book and ignoring the rest thus similar to money your attention be paid with an opportunity cost so you could have earned money uh, in this time you are attending this class so your attention is being paid as a well, I'm sure that your investment of it right now is worthwhile you have been highly motivated option carefully to produce a nice book okay thanks <laughs> attention is the keystone in the arch of life and okay 
and since economics studies the allocation of scarce resources in an era where human economy has a limited valuable and scarce commodity that can be exchanged so you can develop to capitalize on attention and on music or video streaming services we either pay attention to their ads or pay money to hide them for for growth in the world of online games we either pay attention to participate in the battles which attract new gamers or instantly become powerful and nothing comes for free so all in all information in our environment is not scarce so attention is very scarce and uh, when inspecting a visual scene our optic nerve receives information at the order of 10 bits per second so that's what your eyes are seeing uh, this is the frequency at which they are getting the information which is far exceeding what our brain can fully process and fortunately our ancestors learned from experience uh, also known as the data that not all sensory inputs are created equal so throughout human history the capability of paying attention to only a fraction of information of interest has enabled our brain to allocate resources more smartly to survive to grow and to socialize such as detecting predators prey and mates the in the the motivation for attention it is is coming biology so to explain our how our attention is deployed in the real world visual world it has emerged and been pervasive so this idea dates back to william james in 1890s who is considered as the father of american psychology in this framework subjects selectively direct the sp- attention using both non volitional cue and volitional cue so this actually means that uh, without your wish and volitional cue is with your wish so cues are uh, the it's like subjects are directing the spotlight to these these are the different cues and the non volitional cue is based on the saliency and the conspicuity of objects in the environment imagine there are five objects in front of you a newspaper a research paper a cup of coffee a notebook and a book why All the paper products are printed in black and white. The coffee cup is in red, so you can see that this is in red. And in other words, this coffee is intrinsically salient and conspicuous in this visual environment. Automatically and involuntarily drawing attention. So it's drawing attention to your eye, and so you bring the fovea onto the coffee as shown in figure. Uh, okay. So after drinking coffee, you become caffeinated, and you are in. and you want to read a book so you turn your head refocus your eyes and look at the book as depicted in this figure and different from the previous case wherein the coffee biases you towards selecting based on saliency in this task dependent case you select the book under cognitive and volitional control so based on your wish based on your volition you you select the book and using your volitional cue based on the variable selection criteria this form of attention is more deliberate it is also more powerful with the subject's voluntary effort now comes the concept of queries key and values so very briefly we have seen this uh, initially when we talked about attention in the nlp course by deep learning from deep learning specialization uh, so inspired by the non volitional and volitional attention cues that explain the attentional deployment in the following we will describe a framework for designing attention mechanisms by incorporating these two, two attention cues so to begin with consider the simpler case where only non volitional cues are available so to bias so in this case let's say only non volitional cues are available and to bias selection over sensory inputs we can simply use a parameterized fully connected layer or even non parameterized mats or average pooling so this is the this is the query query is the volitional cue which is like uh, you want to read a book so that's a volitional cue and now this the coffee cup is red so your attention just goes to the coffee cup you don't have to you don't have to uh, you don't have to make an effort to give attention to this coffee this is a non volitional cue and so query is a volitional cue and keys are non volitional cues whereas value is in the inputs so 
Okay. So therefore, what sets attention mechanisms apart from those fully connected layers on is the inclusion of volitional cues. So how is attention uh, separate? The fully connected layers or pooling layers is the this this queries these volitional cues and in the context of attention mechanisms we refer to volition cues as query given any query attention mechanisms by action over sensory inputs that is intermediate via attention pooling so the keys or the non volitional cues and the volition queries or the volitional cues they will go to the attention pooling and which will generate the attention and these sensory inputs are called values in the context of attention mechanisms so more generally every value is paired with a key so associate with respect to a non volitional cue which can be thought of as non volitional cue of the sensory input so this figure we can design attention pooling so that the given queries which guide by a selection over the values sign of attention mechanisms for instance we got not that can be trained using reinforcement learning method it's the dominance of the framework in this figure models under this framework will be the center of our attention in the chapter so visualization of attention i put where the weights are uniform in practice attention pooling aggregates values uh, using weighted average where weights are computed between uh, the given queries and different keys so this library that they have built d2l and uh, so the book also is available at this website d2l.ai and they have the implementation in all the three popular frameworks mxnet pytorch and tensorflow we will see the tensorflow uh, the pytorch uh, implementation and so to visualize attention networks we define the show heat maps function its input matrices uh, matrices have the shape number of rows for display comma number of columns for display comma number of queries comma Keys. So we show the heat map by this. So D two L dot use SVG display number of rows, comma number of columns equal to matrices dot shape one, shape one, and then you make this subplot. As, so number of rows, comma by number of columns, you have the fig size, and for I comma row axis, comma row matrices in enumerate. So you enumerate along the uh, all the all the axis and you uh, you plot this you do an im show matrix dot detach numpy so this will what will this do okay so this will plot something so if you if you will do that and then you show the heat maps so for demonstration we consider a simple where attention weight is only uh, is one only when the query and key are the same otherwise uh, it is zero so so only when the query and key are uh, is one, uh, then only the so attention weight is otherwise it is zero. So for that you can see the this is the this is the heat map. So the uh, queries. So you have a diagonal uh, attention weights in this case. And in subsequent sections we will often invoke this function to visualize attention weights. And in summary. Limited valuable squares, subjects selectively both non volitional and volitional cues. The former is based on saliency and the latter is task dependent. It is based on saliency. Volitional cues are based on is, is task dependent. Attention. Attention over values via attention pooling, which incorporates queries and key so and we can visualize attention weights between queries and keys so exercises which you can do at your end and uh, okay so this is on attention of so the nadaraya what watson kernel regression 
so now you know the two major component attention mechanisms under the framework of the previous figure that we have seen so to recapitulate the interaction between and the attention pooling selectively used to produce the output in this section we will discuss and pooling in great detail relation mechanisms work in practice and specifically the watson kernel regression model proposed in 1964 is a simple yet complete example for demonstrating the machine learning with attention mechanisms so we will first uh, see the data generation let us consider the following regression problem given a data set of input output pairs so this is like simple linear regression so n so how to learn a function f so this function f to predict the output y hat which is x vertex so here we generate an artificial artificial with noise term epsilon and uh, where epsilon is 50 training examples and 50 test examples under visualize a pattern of the attention layer the training inputs are sorted at uh, we are generating 50 training examples 50 test examples this is our function and uh, so this is these are our inputs uh, x underscore train now our y underscore train is f of x underscore train plus uh, this epsilon uh, so this epsilon from this normal distribution with the mean zero standard deviation okay. and this is the number of number of samples that have to be uh, that have to be sampled from this not similarly we generate 50 uh, test examples and what is the length of our test set this is n test and the following function plots all the training examples uh, represented by circles the ground truth data generated generated function f without the noise term labeled by truth and the learned prediction function so this one is basically plots x test comma y truth and y hat so corresponding to the test uh, inputs it plots the uh, ground truth values and the model predicted values and uh, the zeros with zeros you can you can see the uh, x train comma y train plot so the average uh, will begin with uh, perhaps the world's dumbest estimator for this regression problem you the average pooling to average over all the training inputs so you you see the average pooling which we are trying to uh, use to map from x to y so you basically uh, you basically average over all the uh, all the labels or all the outputs and so which is plotted as below so as we can see this estimator is indeed not so smart so this is the prediction so you basically just take average of all the uh, all the data in the in the training data set and then uh, which is really a bad model function pooling so obviously average pooling omits the inputs xi so you see here we do not have any uh, dependency on the xi uh, and watson to weigh the outputs y correlations so according to the input locations so what are the input locations so they have they use a kernel function k and uh, kernel of x Minus x i are divided by sum of kernel of x minus. So, so this is like you will sum over all uh, i is equal to one to n. I, so this will be a this will so i for i is equal to one. Uh, so this this will this will become like uh, x minus x one divided by summation of j equal to one to n x minus x1 x minus xj so this is sum over all the kernels for all the data points and this is just for the uh, for the uh, one for that particular number and uh, so for you can see that for i equal to for i equal to 1 you will have x minus xi for i equal to 2 so you will basically sum over all such 
uh, its its expansion and the estimator is called the nadaraya watson curve